Hello, thank you for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today, we'll be learning about the purpose of worship. The scripture we'll be looking at is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 25. If you'd like to follow along with the life notes, you can download them on our website at calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here's Pastor Chad Garrison. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14 is our text. And if uh, you are in the room and you don't have a Bible and you want to follow along with us, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1140, page 1140. You'll be able to find 1 Corinthians 14 and follow along with us in this text. And as always, if you're in the room and you don't have a Bible and you want one, please take one of those with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word and read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then message us. We'll be glad to get you a Bible because we want everyone to, to read Scripture because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, I'm, uh, I'm wearing the jersey because in about an hour, uh, you know, Arizona and uh, Los Angeles are playing in the uh, National League Division Series. And, you know, if you don't believe in miracles, the fact that the Diamondbacks are there playing right now is evidence <laughs> that miracles exist. So uh, I just, uh, just gonna, you know, wear it uh, because I want the miracles to continue. Uh, but anyway, hey, uh, beyond uh, our teams that we root for, uh, how many of you guys actually like your families? Like, want to, okay. Well, I'm just checking, you know. Do you want to take care of your family? You want to provide for your family? Do you want to, you know, make sure that they don't fight and tear each other apart uh, when you're gone? <laughs> Some of you are like, I'm not planning on leaving. Uh, so, hey, look, uh, on November the 12th, uh, we have an opportunity for you to bless uh, your family. Uh, we have an estate planning seminar uh, luncheon that we're going to be doing uh, just because we care about you and your family. And I, I'm just going to say this. If you uh, have a family at all and you care about them at all, it would be really wise for you to have a will or a trust. And you need to have a plan so that you can bless the people who are left behind. You need to have a plan so that they don't fight and devour each other as much. Uh, you need to, you know, you need to go ahead and carry out your wishes. And so we're trying to help you do that. This is, and, and I know some of you are younger in here and you're going, oh God, I don't have to listen to that. Uh, if you've got kids at home, it is especially important for you to have uh, an estate plan. And I'm just going to say this, uh, and, it, and you might think it's morbid, but it's reality. If uh, you have kids that are part of your life and you're raising them right now and something happens to both spouses, uh, the state will decide what happens to your kids if you don't have an estate plan. And uh, so if you want to take care of your family the best, then you need to have a plan. And, and uh, as part of that, we're gonna be offering discounted uh, you know, estate plans and, and things like that. So I'm just, I just want you to know we're having this luncheon. It's November the 12th. It's a Sunday afternoon right after we get done with services. It's gonna be at McCulloch, so seating is limited. So go online and sign up for that, calvaryaz.com events and look for it. And uh, e even if you don't like it, I'm buying you lunch. So uh, there's that. I mean, can't really argue with that, can you? I mean, some of you are like, I want it a little more personal than that. Well, then call and make an appointment, but uh, otherwise. Hey, I've, I've been doing ministry a long time, which is why I'm talking about estate planning and things like that. I've been doing ministry for 42 years. And, uh, and during that time, I've witnessed a multitude of church fights. Uh, but the two most consistent topics that are fought over in churches, uh, you probably should like lean over and whisper them to, your, to whoever's sitting next to you, see if, you're, see if you're right. It's money and it's worship. It's money and it's worship. We're not talking about money today. Uh, so in case you're wondering. Uh, we are discussing worship. Uh, a few years back, uh, the term worship wars was coined as generations fight over the style of music, the volume of music, the order of worship, the volume of music, instruments used in worship, volume of music, <laughs> and song selection, and I think volume of music. But um, 
So at, at Calvary during the years, uh, I mean, seriously, we've battled, uh, I've been here 31 years, so we battled about the order of service, uh, the frequency of communion, what instruments we're, we're, we're gonna use. I remember being there when we introduced drums on stage for the first time. Uh, we actually argued about organ speakers. We had organs back then, and, uh, and the organists got mad because they weren't controlling the volume on their speakers, and, and, uh, and so they protested by quitting, so we became organ donors. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> And we'll see how that flies at 8 o'clock. Uh, anyway, <laughs> and we started a, a modern worship service in 2004, which quickly outgrew the more traditional services that we had. And now, of course, now we have uh, three modern worship services here in Havasu, one in Parker. Uh, and, uh, but that led to our biggest church fight ever, with about 80 people leaving at one time uh, in protest. And, and the, the crazy thing is, that doesn't seem like a whole lot now, but we were, you know, one-third the size we are now, and it was about, uh, it'd be like if 250 people walked out the door uh, at one time right now. It, we, trust me, it, it hurt. So, uh, of course, fighting about worship is nothing new. Um, they were arguing about worship almost 2,000 years ago in Corinth when the Apostle Paul wrote this letter. Now, if you're new to us and, and you haven't been a part of this, we've been in 1 Corinthians for uh, several months now, and it's the message to the messed up church because they fought about everything. They fought about, you know, pride and they fought about, you know, we just fought with each other over who's going to get to do what. They fought about, you know, uh, perversion and they fought about lawsuits and they fought about communion and they fought about women and they, fought, they just fought about everything. So uh, this is consistent with them. But today we're talking about the purpose of worship. Because if you get the purpose right, all the other stuff is easy to navigate. So first and primary purpose of worship is to glorify God. The purpose of worship is to glorify God. In other words, we gather here to glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus. We just sang a beautiful song about him, uh, Lord of heaven and earth. So he's the creator, he's the sustainer, he's the redeemer, he's the king of kings. And, and, and I think we all would go, yes, we're here to, to worship God. And you know what that means? That means that worship is not about you. And it's not about me. It's about Jesus. Now, I say that, I know that honestly, we all have preferences about worship. We all have preferences about the music style. We all have preferences about the song selection. Uh, okay, let's just take a little poll. How many of you, when you're getting ready for, for coming to worship, you're thinking, I hope they sing your favorite song? Right? Okay, a lot of hands went up. Thank you. I mean, you know, look, there, there are times that I sit down for the meetings before the service, and, and I'm like, oh, okay, I don't like those songs. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> as much as the other songs, okay? I mean, they're, they're all great. But anyway, the, uh, but, you know, we all have that. And, and we all have opinions about volume and instruments and preferences make it easier to worship. Okay, when, when we like the songs, when we like the vibe, all that, we're, we, we, it's easier. But, I just gotta say this, if you won't worship God because you don't like the music, then who are you making worship about? See, um, worship is about glorifying God. And, and here at Calvary, uh, we don't let personal preference prevail. And, and if, you know, probably everybody says that, but let me just illustrate to you how seriously we take the fact that mission prevails, not preferences. And I've told this story before, so if you've heard it, forgive me, but about five years ago, uh, we were here, uh, it might have been a Saturday night, probably was, because that's when my wife usually comes to, to worship, and uh, we were in the back and listening, and, and she goes, you know, some of those songs we used to sing, like, you know, 10 years ago, they were modern songs, but, you know, like some for 10 years, those are still really good songs, we should sing those, and, and you know, it'd be better if we could just turn it down a little bit. That's what, that's what she said to me. And I said, no. <laughs> and of course, because she is both submissive and uh, not quiet, uh, <laughs> she said to me, why not? And, and this response was God-given. I had not practiced it and I hadn't rehearsed it. I had not thought of it before, but it popped out of my mouth. And I said to her, because we're not trying to reach 55-year-old Christian women. Okay, look, if I said that to my wife, you understand, we don't take, we, we all understand, all of us have preferences. 
They don't build this worship service for me, and they don't build this service for my wife, and they don't build it for you. Hey, look, I, honestly, if you're going, well, who do you build it for? We're trying to reach the young families. That's what we want. We want to reach the, the 30-somethings and, and, and those that have kids, and we want the teenagers to not go, this is so lame. <laughs> I just, be honest, now we're not doing rap music, so you can praise God for that, but uh, <laughs> some of you are like, come on, let's do it. Uh, but worship is about glorifying God. Th look, when we come to worship, it is about glorifying our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that means that if we're gonna glorify God, that involves celebration. It involves celebration. Psalm 100, just listen to this. This is a psalm they would, they would say or sing on their way to the temple. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. The kingdom of God is a party and we've been invited to join the celebration. And worship is celebrating God's goodness, God's creation, God's blessings, and God's salvation. All this and more is cause to celebrate. And I'm just gonna point out, it's really hard to celebrate quietly. Have you ever tried to do that, celebrate quietly? It's just awkward, like, yeah. You know, how many of you, though, have been a part of churches that told you to be quiet in worship? Besides me, okay? A lot of you have been a part of churches that were like, shh. Our first big worship war at Calvary, uh, just our fight about worship, was uh, right after I came and, and was pastor, so I was young, still had dark hair, uh, uh, just one daughter, and she was two. So that, that's how long ago it was. And, and so... Uh, Look, I, do, I did then what I do now. I go out and greet people before the service because I like people. Uh, and people go, well, shouldn't you be praying before the service? I prayed before the service, but not when the people are here. So uh, me and God already talked. So, you know, and I'm talking to people and people are talking to each other. And I think that's great. And the organists uh, came to me and said, and some other people, it's too loud before the service. They said it's too loud before the service. I said, what do you mean it's too loud before this? Well, it, people need to be, you know, meditating and, and they need to listen to the organ music that's being played and, and meditate. And I go, no, it's, it's not gonna happen. You have to get another pastor because I'm gonna talk to people. That's what happens. And, and here's what they said. They said, pastor, it's okay if you talk to people. We want everyone else to shut up. <laughs> they didn't say shut up. Okay, that's my word. Uh, but, but they don't need to talk, just you, I go, uh, sorry, uh, I don't believe in this whole, you know, rules apply to you, but not me. I said, no, I'm gonna talk, and they're gonna talk, and that's good, we want people to talk, uh, because, and, and they kept saying, but it's not reverence. And I said, reverence isn't a volume, it's a heart thing. See, celebrate, but we can't, like, celebrate quietly. So, uh, worship involves celebration, and worship involves gratitude. You know, Psalm 136 just begins, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. When we enter the presence of God, we are compelled to give thanks. I mean, how can we not be grateful? God created us, God loves us, God is with us. God forgives us, God saves us and redeems our lives. Jesus died for our sins so that we get to go to heaven even though we deserve hell. Think about that. Just, just think about that, and you have cause to be grateful. And honestly, I'm just gonna say this, and I don't know who it applies to, but if you're not filled with gratitude toward God, you may not really understand grace. And that's a problem. Probably should talk to us afterwards. So are you grateful? Because worship involves celebration, it involves gratitude, and worship requires submission. If we're gonna glorify God, we need to submit. Romans chapter 12, verse one, the apostle Paul says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. 
If we're really gonna worship God, if we're gonna glorify God, that means that we come to him and we come to him in submission, that we surrender our rights, our will, our lives to him as an offering of worship. See, honestly, we can't glorify God if we do not submit to him. See, when we surrender and submit, we're confessing Jesus is our Lord and the idea in following Jesus is daily surrender to his leadership and to his wisdom. Now, in, in you know, the old terms, uh, submission was about bowing down. And, and a lot of times we think of bowing as like on our knees before someone. But bowing down in that you know, biblical picture was on your face. Fully prostrate before the king. And the king could kill you or the king could lift you up. Now, our king is Jesus, so we know he's not intent on killing us because he already died to save us. He is going to lift you up. You can submit to him with full confidence that he wants the best for you. After all, he gave his life to rescue us from hell. So worship is first and foremost to glorify God. And secondly, worship is to build up the church. 1 Corinthians 14, we're picking up there in verse one. I'm gonna read a bit. Paul says, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Uh, when he's talking about prophesy, he's talking about teaching the truth of God. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Now brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments such as the flute or harp do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many languages in the world and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you're saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. Paul says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. So the purpose of worship and the purpose of spiritual gifts are building up the church. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then God the Holy Spirit is in you and he's given you gifts to build up the church and you are called to worship Jesus so that you can be built up as part of the church and therefore build up the church. But what we do, we do to encourage all, not one. I don't know if you caught that from the Apostle Paul, but he's really clear. What we do, we do to encourage all, not one. The conflict in Corinth was about individual experiences versus group edification. Okay, did, did you catch that? He was saying, hey, look, when you, when you pray in a tongue, and they were there to argue about tongues. We already covered that for a couple of weeks in 1 Corinthians 12. When, because they're arguing about tongues. He goes, when you do that in tongues, you're, you're building yourself up. That's really cool for you, but it's not good for the people around you. What we want to do is edify the whole group, build up the whole group 
And, and that requires a, a different thing. So he's, he's taken their battle was about the one versus everyone. And Paul declares the priority is the church. The priority is the family. The priority is the body of Christ, the whole body, not just one part. And he says, worship builds up the church, first of all, through encouragement. He says, you know, you're built up by being encouraged. Verse three, he says, on the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. We gather here to celebrate our life in Jesus and encourage one another on our spiritual journey. And my prayer is that you leave here motivated to follow Jesus. Okay, and then, and then worship builds up the church through growth. Verse four, he says, the one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Look, we gather to teach, to explain, to challenge all of us to be growing disciples of Jesus. Okay, uh, I, and, and I know, uh, look, everybody talks about, oh, I love being fed. I want the, I want the preacher to feed me. Like, I, I just want to tell you, um, even my two-year-old granddaughter does not want me to feed her anymore. <laughs> she wants to feed herself. If we're growing up spiritually, we need to learn how to feed ourselves. Our Next Steps classes, October 29th, we have a class called Grow. Guess what it's about? It's about learning how to feed yourself. It's about growing up in Christ. And if you don't know how to do that, we'd love to invite you to come at six o'clock and learn how to grow. Uh, we give away Bibles so that you can read them because we know if you read and apply God's word, guess what God's gonna do? He's gonna change your life because it'll happen. It, it, you know, that's why it's so important to learn in school how to read. Um, we've got life groups to, that you can be a part of. You know, and, and we've been promoting life groups. We want you to connect to life groups because we know you're gonna grow if you're surrounded by people who love Jesus and are seeking him. We've got a group called Alpha that is introducing people to what it means to follow Jesus. We've got a group called Celebrate Recovery that will help you grow through the... <laughs> yeah, Monday night, 6.30 in this room. And look, they, they help you grow through the things that stop you from growing get you unstuck in life. But, but it, you know, when we worship, we want you to leave here knowing more about God and how to please him or how to take those steps to get there. So worship builds up the church through encouragement and growth and union. Look, we're the family of God. We're the body of Jesus. We're united in Christ. That's why we celebrate communion. We talked about that a few weeks ago too. It makes us one, it unites us. The Holy Spirit that, that is in me is in you. And so we're connected. And by the way, we're celebrating communion next week, if you're wondering. So, uh, you know, that, that's coming up. We're connected by the Holy Spirit. He gave us gifts to use to build up the church. And together, we are loved by Jesus and we are called to love each other. And if you missed last week, you can listen to the sermon about love. See, we can't do any of that unless we're united in spirit and in purpose. And the Spirit wants us to love each other, and the purpose is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's what we're about. We wanna be connected at that point. So we all come together to celebrate Jesus, to be filled with gratitude and to surrender to his leadership so that we can learn and encourage and grow together as followers of Jesus and leave here on a mission. That's what we're trying to do in worship, a lot of stuff. But I wanted you to understand the purpose of worship. And that leads us to the third purpose of worship, which is to proclaim the gospel. Proclaim the gospel. Look over, at, still in chapter 14, verse 23. If therefore the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. Our mission as a church is what? I just told you. Yeah. I, I love the fact that eight of you know it. Um, it's on the wall out front. We mention it like 18 times a service. Calvary exists. Our mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's it. That's why we do what we do. It's everything. Uh, and, and, and that's proclaiming the gospel. And, and Paul is saying, look, I expect unbelievers, outsiders, to come and worship with you. 
And when they come, he says, I want them to clearly hear the gospel. I want them to understand it because if they understand the gospel, it's gonna pierce their hearts. It's gonna change their lives. It's gonna set people free. It's gonna lead them to eternal life. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the point. And at Calvary, we expect the unchurched people to be here because we expect you to bring your friends and your family and your coworkers and your neighbors. And we know people are gonna show up who are struggling with brokenness and loss or despair or people are gonna show up who are seeking truth and the meaning of life. And because of this expectation, we worship with intentionality. I just want you to know a lot of effort and intentionality goes into what we're doing. I'm just gonna tell you what we do. We strive for excellence in everything we do. We strive for excellence in music, whether you like the style or not. We strive for excellence in teaching. We strive for excellence in children's ministry and in our facilities because we don't want to embarrass you when you bring your friends. See, we're counting on you bringing your friends and our commitment is when they come, uh, we're, not, <laughs> we're not gonna embarrass you by you bringing them here. Okay, we try to put friendly people out there as greeters. And by the way, if you're friendly and you're not doing anything, why don't you sign up to be a greeter? First impressions. I mean, that's just the way. We want them to have a great experience with their kids in, you know, in, the, in the children's ministry. And we can always, if you love kids and you can pass their background check, we'd love for you to volunteer and help out with the ministry. I'm really beginning to wonder about a lot of you because we don't have a ton of people volunteering when I say that. So I don't know what you did in your past. But Jesus forgives you and you'd be surprised at what you can still, how you can still serve uh, with your speckled past. But anyway, so, you know, we got a team of people who clean this place because we don't want it to be filthy. We want to be embarrassed. Same way that you, when you invite guests to your home, you want it to be, uh, they want it to look good. That's what we want. So uh, we strive for excellence and we try not to embarrass, confuse, frustrate, or freak out our guests. Okay, I'm just telling you, we don't, we don't want to be weird or awkward. And I, it's hard for me because I'm always awkward. So, uh, but we don't want them to feel weird or awkward. And, and by the way, this is why we don't emphasize the ecstatic gifts in worship because worship isn't about the one, it's about the many. Worship isn't about you, it's about us celebrating Jesus. So I just want you to understand that. Uh, some of you have come from churches where there's a lot more uh, expression of, you know, excitement about Jesus during the, during the services, you know, whether it's uh, people speaking in tongues or people running up and down aisles or rolling on the floors and things like that. Can I just tell you, uh, you know, if that is how you li love to worship God, great, praise God, that's fine. We're just not doing that here because we expect people to bring their friends. And here's what happens. If a bunch of us are doing that and, you bring, and people bring their friends, they're gonna stop bringing their friends because their friends are gonna be like freaked out. <laughs> and it goes back to what's our mission? To lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So we're just like, hey, this is what, what we're doing. That's why we worship for an hour as well because we don't want your friends to get worn out at either. And intentionally, we, we try not to make money an issue, which is why we have offering boxes and if you're a guest, we don't want your money. We want your information. We want to be able to connect with you so we can get to know you, answer questions, and hopefully help you on your journey uh, spiritually. That's what we want. The offering boxes are for our members, people who are committed to Calvary, the people who are, believe in our mission. And by the way, offering boxes and, you know, <laughs> are, are secondary to online giving anyway because most everybody does things electronically these days. So we plan with intentionality so that you can lead your friends, your family, your neighbors to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And we hope you trust us enough to bring your friends with you. And then we worship with relevance. Intentionality and relevance. Because we're on a mission. I mean, we already told you. And, and by the way, when, when we as a church or collection of churches send missionaries uh, to another country, we ask them to learn two things necessary for success. Two things, okay? So lean over to the person next to you, tell them what you think those two things are that they need to learn uh, necessary for success when we send a missionary, okay? You guys aren't leaning, you're not whispering. You guys like completely no idea? If you're a missionary, you're being sent to another country, what, there's two things you have to learn. One is language, right? Because you gotta speak the language that they speak 
Otherwise, you can't communicate to them. And the second thing is culture. Because if you don't learn the culture, you're going to embarrass yourself and everybody's going to dismiss you. Language and culture. That's what relevance is. It's trying to speak to our culture's um, language and, their, and how they do life, the people around us. So um, we try to be culturally relevant enough to people so they don't dismiss us as being completely clueless or out of date. Even though I'm a dinosaur, I still want to be, you know, uh, able to talk to people. And we try to be culturally relevant in a way to teach God's eternal truth in a language people can understand without going to Bible school. And that's reality. You don't need to be a Bible scholar to understand the Word of God. Here's what we're not going to do. We're never going to compromise or water down biblical truth. We just want to speak in a language and in a way that communicates the gospel clearly to people so lives will be changed so that they want to join us in worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's the purpose of worship. And I hope that helps you worship Jesus. Now, if you're here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, we would love for you to join with us in celebrating Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as Savior of this world. And if you're thinking you'd like to make that decision, can we just invite you to do something? Can you, can you find one of the pastors and just tell us? We'd love to talk with you one-on-one. Uh, or the prayer team's gonna be here at the front. They would love to pray with you and talk with you. And if you won't do either of those things, would you at least fill out a Connect card and say, I wanna talk to someone about Jesus this week? You'll be our priority. And we'll be praying for you and encouraging you on your spiritual journey. Let's pray together. Father, it's amazing that you invite us to worship you. I mean, we've been rebels. We've defied you. Uh, we've, you know, just engaged in so many embarrassing things as the sinners that we are. And yet, through the sacrifice of Jesus, you have forgiven us of all of our sins. You've adopted us as sons and daughters. And now you've invited us to worship you, to join with all of creation in celebrating the goodness of God and the glory of God. So Father, uh, help us to worship better. Help us to make it about you, not about us. Help us to celebrate and be filled with gratitude. And Father, help us to surrender so that you can be glorified in our lives and we can be used on your mission of life change. We know that we can't do any of this without your help. So we invite you to speak to us, to teach us, and to change us in Jesus' name. Amen. If today's message spoke to you and you would like to support the ministry of Calvary, you can do so by visiting our website, calvaryaz.com. The homepage has links to contact us, to give, listen to past sermons, and subscribe to the Word for the Day daily devotionals. That's it for today. I hope you'll join us again next week. Bye-bye.